So also thank you everyone for for coming tonight. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm also I'm really excited that um, you're all willing to add a water temperature monitoring component to this citizen science um, smelt monitoring project. Um, this is really important and it's going to help us collect some baseline temperature data in some of these smelt streams that are either currently important to smelt as corridors or as spawning areas. Um, so Ruth and I have developed a protocol for this. Um, everyone's going to get a copy of this protocol. It has a step-by-step -step, um, in-depth directions on how to deploy this in the stream. So this isn't the one shot that you'll get to learn all of this information. Um, and I'm just gonna go through um, some of those, just gonna go through the protocol tonight. Um, and if I can figure out how to share my screen, again, there we go. <clears throat> and I think if you want to, like, if you want to type questions into the chat, that's fine. Um, I think it's a small enough group. If you want to just jump in with a question, does that work, Kristen? That's Definitely. Totally fine too. Um, yeah. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end as well. Okay. So you're going to see. Okay, can everyone see that? Should say water temperature monitoring protocol, great. All right, and so I did start, I wanted to start off by again saying thank you. Um, you're really helping us to fill these knowledge gaps um, and capture these baseline temperatures in diadromous fish streams throughout the Kennebec estuary and beyond it. Um, you know, Ruth and I are two people, and the fact that we have, I think, around 14 volunteers to monitor these sites is fantastic. Um, that would take us a few full days of work to do, and I'm really thankful to have your help with this water temperature monitoring effort. So in this training today, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking with a brief overview about um, the importance of water temperature. We'll go over some safety protocols and I'll talk about the materials that you'll be getting to monitor water temperature. We'll cover the methods, particularly site selection, um, the characteristics to look for in a stream when you're deploying a water temperature logger, um, different types of anchors, filling out the data sheets and using the Hobo Mobile app. So you will have to download an app um, on your smartphone to program the logger, but we'll go through that process tonight and using the app itself. So I apologize if you've attended my other lectures because you, um, you might have seen the slide already, but I just did want to talk about the importance of water temperature. It's really the primary control on the type of species, the number of species, and the variety of species in an aquatic environment. Particularly here in Maine, we have quite a few cold water fish species like Atlantic salmon and eastern brook trout um, and rainbow smelt that are all, they all thrive in cold water temperatures and they start to experience stress when the temperature goes above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Water temperature has a huge impact on the growth and activity, production, and survival of aquatic species. It affects migration and spotting and dispersal patterns. Um, alewife are a good example of this. Um, when water temperatures reach 52 degrees Fahrenheit, it's a major cue for alewife to start spawning. Smelt also have these water temperature cues. I think it, for smelt, it's around 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Water temperature has an impact on predator prey overlap. Um, here in Maine, we have a lot of native and non-native warm water game fish um, that are that would be ex huge predators of fish like salmon and brook trout. Um, but the species that thrive in warm water environments are generally isolated and kept, or historically have been in different habitats than our cold water game fish. And finally, water temperature does have an impact on water quality. In general, colder water has more dissolved oxygen um, and that affects the health of living things in the aquatic environment. In a nutshell, this is what you're signing up for. Uh, everyone is going to be programming temperature sensors that are about this size of this tidbit logger in the first circle at the bottom of the screen. You're attaching them to metal anchors with zip ties, which we will provide for you. 
and placing them at the bottom of streams and they will just continue to record stream temperature measurements throughout the entire smelt season. Um, then you will go out and download the data and you'll be contributing that data to a shared online database that is publicly accessible. Um, this is an actual photo of all the water temperature monitoring sites across the state of Maine. So your site will show up on this map. Um, this is available for the public to view and download and look at water temperatures. Um, the website is bb.ecosheds.org slash viewer. And at the end of the smelt season, we will have your data uploaded onto that public database. I did just wanna cover safety really quickly before we get into the procedures um, and to emphasize that your safety is the number one issue of importance. Never compromise your safety to collect data. Um, everyone's adult, everyone's an adult. I think like you can trust your own judgment, use your best judgment, but I really wanna emphasize that loggers and anchors are replaceable, you are not. So just the primary issue of importance, anytime that you're in the field, it's, it's always your safety. Um, go out to the field with a partner or let somebody know where you're going, avoid deeper swift water, um, pay attention to the bottom of streams. Um, and also important, check the tides. Some of you will be in sites that are impacted by the tides and it will be very difficult to retrieve a logger from the bottom of the stream at high tide. These are some of the materials that you will get in your citizen scientist water temperature monitoring kit. Um, this picture on the left is a tidbit logger. This is pretty close to actual size. So it's a small rugged device. It can be programmed to collect water temperature measurements every 30 minutes, and then you could leave it out in the stream for five years before it fills up. Everyone will have to provide a Bluetooth enabled smart device and download the Hobo Mobile app. We will give you anchoring supplies. Um, so a metal anchor, a cable to attach that anchor um, to a tree or a log. Um, some of you will get anchors attached to bricks to set on the bottom of the stream. It depends on your site. Everyone will get a citizen scientist monitoring protocol. You will get some property tags and zip ties to attach to your anchors and your loggers. Um, to identify it as kelp property. Um, that really helps us avoid vandalism or people tampering with the equipment. You will get a clipboard. Um, I had hoped to give everybody metric rulers so that you could measure water depth at your logger site. Those haven't come in yet, um, but hopefully we'll get them not too far in the future. Um, and everyone will also get two data sheets that they can fill out, one for deployment and one for a weekly site check. For all sites, you want to find a location that is representative of flow that's going on in the river. So you wanna look for turbulence, um, any a place in the river that has signs of mixing, um, shallow riffles, anywhere in this area would be a perfect site to put a temperature logger. You want to try your best to, to get a site that will be covered by water for the entire time. So look for low water marks. Um, especially if you're at a tidal site, um, go out there at low tide and try to deploy your logger in a place um, that has enough water to keep it covered at the lowest tide. Um, most important, avoid the bottom of deep pools. Um, avoid really stagnant areas where the water isn't flowing. Um, it'll, the water temperature will be much colder at the bottom of a pool and in stagnant areas, you might not get that mixing. So you just, you might not get good representation of water temperature. Um, so anywhere in this box is where I would deploy a temperature logger at my site. Um, also, the edge of this pool is fine. Um, you just don't wanna put it at the very bottom of a deep pool. There are three different types of anchors. Um, we can help you pick out one that is appropriate for your site. The cable anchor method is most preferable because it's nearly impossible to lose any of these anchors. Um, but this is only appropriate for rivers or creeks with riparian cover or logs, um, maybe even some boulders near riffles where you could actually attach a cable on an anchor. There are some sites where you just don't have any good attachment sites. Um, and in those cases, 
you can just place your anchor at the bottom of a stream. Um, this is only appropriate really for protected creeks that are very shallow with firm substrate. Um, we wouldn't want to put this out in a big unprotected stream because it, it might move around in an area like that. Finally, some of you will get a metal anchor or a PVC anchor attached to a brick. Um, and this is most appropriate for small creeks with really soft substrate where we think the anchor might get buried if it's just resting on the bottom by itself. There aren't too many of these sites, um, but there are a few of them. So again, the cable anchor method is preferable. Um, this ensures that anchors stay put, but you need a good attachment site. So you need to have trees on the banks or logs in the streams. <coughs> and these are all examples of actual sites um, where, I've, where I have attached an anchor with a cable. Um, in this top picture, this is a, attached to a nice convenient root wad. Um, and the cable, the temperature logger is actually located right here um, in the shallow riffle at the edge of this pool. This is just a close up of what it looks like attached to the root. Um, here, this is just attached to a log in the stream at Cat Hans Falls. Um, again, this isn't a nice, beautiful riffle, but there is still some mixing going on in there. There's a little turbulence. Um, you can see that the water is flowing in that area. Uh, these are actual sites. These are chained, not cables, but it's the same kind of idea. And I just put these pictures up here to show that even though that first picture that I showed you was a beautiful riffle with it with an ideal anchoring site, you're just not always going to get that at your site. Um, so sometimes you just pick what's out there. Um, in both of these sites, the flow is really slow, but you can still see evidence of mixing right here. Um, and again, here we have a little bit of flow moving through this area. So just look for those signs of mixing. Um, turbulence near a good attachment site. Next, the bottom anchor method. Um, this is for protected shallow sites without any good attachments. So one thing that's really important for these sites is to look for large and really easily recognizable boulders or landmarks that will both protect the logger and help you locate it again. I think the number one concern with placing an anchor just on the bottom of the stream is that you will need to go back to the exact same spot and relocate it. Um, so these are all good sites. Um, this bottom picture is an actual site. It's maybe five or six feet downstream of a culvert in a, in a little pool where you see some mixing occurring. And again, because the culvert is right upstream, this is really protected and you have mixing occurring in here and it's going to be pretty hard to lose that um, since you just have to go immediately downstream of that culvert. Um, this is another location where I might put um, an anchor just on the bottom of the stream. This is immediately upstream of a culvert um, and this is a recognizable rock where I could just rest the anchor and it would be sheltered from flow. It's still in the flow um, and at low tide, you could find that again. So just, again, this is just a close up of that same pool um, or immediately downstream of two culverts if there's no good place to attach a log or two. Um, as long as you have flow and mixing and as long as you have landmarks that can help you locate the anchor again. Finally, the brick anchor method. Um, these are very heavy, um, but it will give you a heavy duty zip tie and then you can just attach this metal anchor to a brick um, and place it at the bottom of the stream. Um, this again is for places with very soft substrate and no good attachment sites. So again, this is an actual site. Um, this is a tidal site. It's got kind of a mucky bottom. And I would just go out to the stream and try to find anywhere where water is flowing, where it's easy to get to. Um, and there's a culvert again immediately upstream of these sites. This is another actual site. Um, you might actually be able to just place an anchor at the bottom of the stream here without a brick, but the substrate does look a little soft. So these would both be good locations to place um, either a bottom anchor or a brick anchor downstream of the culvert where there's some flow, 
but it's not quite at the bottom of the tailwater pool and here around this bend where we would see some current. And again, this is a nice area immediately upstream of a culvert with good mixing and good flow. Uh, I wanted to include this picture because this is another actual site. Um, this is George Wright Road. And for a site like this, I mean, the flow coming out of this culvert is, is incredible. So I would not want you to go anywhere near, um, near the current up here. Um, so in situations like this, um, there's still a little bit of mixing occurring down or immediately upstream here, um, just, Go to a place where you feel safe, where you can relocate the logger, and it also doesn't look like there are any good attachment sites here. So this is a case where I would put an anchor out on a brick or on the bottom of the stream. I just want to pause a minute. Are there any questions before we get into data sheets? Okay. Okay. So. As I mentioned, you will have two data sheets to fill out in the field. Um, the first one is for deployment, and it has a lot of information. Um, you will also complete this with when you program it with the Hobo Mobile Logger app, and I will go over that in the next slide. But you fill out your name, the date and time. This is the date and time that you're actually in the field. Your site name, which will be assigned to you um, by Ruth the town and the road, and that's just in case there's any discrepancy with the site, we can make sure we know where you are. Um, you're going to name your logger by the serial number, which you can find the serial number just on the back of your logger. Then you'll put your initials and then the first three letters of your site. And that's going to be the logger name and the file name in the Hobo Mobile app. And then you are going to program the logger to start logging at midnight on the day after you are deploying it in the field. So today's the ninth. I would program the logger to start on March 10th at midnight. And again, we'll write the serial number twice on the data sheet. You can get your logger anchor coordinates from the Hobo Mobile app. Um, you'll also learn how to do this a different way in the smelt training with the Google Maps app. Um, I, it's whatever your, whatever your preference is, um, but I would like you to pick to circle on the data sheet if you've taken the coordinates from the Hobo Mobile app or Google Maps app, and it's just because they record it differently, so that'll help us to the, convert the coordinates if we need to. Um, and then when we do get rulers for you, um, just measure the water depth from the water surface to the bottom of the anchor. I wanted to give people a chance to download the app if they want to. Um, if you, if everybody just wants to skip that, I can go on ahead. What do you think? If, are people ready? Feel free to let us know. Do you want to download it now and, and kind of work through it? Okay, yes, perfect. I'm seeing heads nodding, okay. so let's wait. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a couple minutes. If you I already have it on your phone for another hobo, do you have to do it again? Nope. You okay. can just add the logger to it. Yeah. Okay. And Kirsten, it looks like Brooke had a question um, in the chat about walking in the stream. I cannot see. Oh, I see. I will just, OK, let's see. Weren't supposed to walk in the streams or pools. Should we also try to put the logger somewhere that we can access without having to walk through the water? Ideally, yes. Um, So this is a tricky question. So some of you won't be in smelt spawning streams. Um, should we also try to put the logger somewhere that we can access without having to walk through the water? So 
That's a good question. Um, because I know there are some people who are who fish and who are going to be putting this in streams where they fish. Um, I, I think that depends on your comfort level um, and where you're placing the logger. Um, many of you will have sites at road stream crossings and at a lot of those sites, you shouldn't have to step into the stream, um, especially at low tide. You can walk by it um, and place it in the water. Um, and that's also why I wanted to show so many different sites. Like I don't want you to walk all over the stream trying to find the very most perfect one. Um, the perfect site is also very easily accessible to you and whatever you're comfortable with. I hope that answered your question. All right, are folks ready to move on? Seeing heads, heads nodding. Okay, perfect. Oh. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now, I'm sorry you don't have a logger to work with <laughs> as we're going through this exercise, but it's good to just have the app on your phone and you can kind of play around with it as we go through this. Okay. All right. So I have a video that's going to go through programming the logger. Um, but I'm narrating it live. So if there are any questions, then we can we can just pause this. Um, so when you open the 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 app, um, you'll see all of the loggers that are in range immediately on this devices screen. Um, this is the default screen that the app connects to. But I want everyone to take a minute and look at all these icons at the bottom of the screen. The very first thing you need to do before you program the logger is tap settings and make sure you are recording in SI units, not US units, um, because that will make sure that we're recording temperature in Celsius. Usually for default, it, it records in Fahrenheit. Um, so all you do is tap the icon to move it from US units to scientific units. While we're on the screen, I want to draw your attention to the about question mark button at the bottom of the page. So if you tap this in your app, then you will be sent to a whole bunch of resources that will help you out if you get stuck um, using the app. So if you tap user's guide and manuals, there are all these how to videos. They go through all these processes step by step. It's best if you're connected to Wi-Fi when you go through this because it does use your data, but these are all free and there are a variety of manuals as well. You can find the type of logger that you have um, and choose the guide that will take you through each step, each, each process step by step. So this is a really useful resource. And then just click devices again to get back to the home screen. So your logger should show up in range. Um, if it doesn't, once you receive it, just push the button at the top of the logger and it will show up in green at the top of the page. And to program it, um, all you have to do is tap it. And in a, in a minute, we'll be connected to the configure screen. Okay, tap configure. If this pops up, don't worry about it. Um, all of these loggers have already been used because I've calibrated them ahead of time. So don't worry about erasing the data. I've already downloaded it. Click yes and move on. So tap name to rename the logger. Um, again, it's the serial number, your initials. I put FT for FWS trainer, and then the first three letters of your site. TRA for training room. And then tap done. And now your logger is renamed. Um, the location shows you your current location. So it's important to emphasize this because if you if you program the logger in your car, it will show the location of your car, not the location of the logger in the stream. So wait to do this programming until you're on the stream bank right near the place where you're going to place the logger in the stream um, and the location the coordinates will change as you move around but once you program the logger then the the coordinates that it will save are the coordinates of the spot that you're standing in so we want to program the logging interval next to just tap tap interval 
you want to program it to record every 30 minutes and you do that just by scrolling up and down and tap done at the top of the page when you're done oh no sorry lost myself <laughs> sorry okay i think we've programmed the logging interval Kristen, we just had a good question from Brooke asking if there's no surface at the site, is there a way to manually enter the latitude and longitude? Oh, that's a good question. I'll have to, I will make that a task for myself to look into. Um, all the sites that I was at, all the sites that I checked last year had service. Um, but I'm thinking that there might be a couple of a couple of new locations where we don't. So I'll look into that. Um, I think a way to get around that might be to just download offline Google Maps um, and use a Google Maps app. And I think some of that should be covered in the smelt training. Um, but I will. That's a good question. I'll look into that. Ah, sorry, <laughs> I keep losing my space in this video. Okay, uh, I think the next step is to, okay, we want to program a delayed start for the logger. So we'll tap start logging. The default is to start logging now um, and select on date and time. And then again, you wanna set it to record the day after you're in the field at midnight and then just tap done when you're finished with that. And done again, and you'll get sent back to the device screen. And the last thing you need to do is select your Bluetooth option. Um, my preference is for you to select Bluetooth off water detect. Um, that way you don't have to worry so much if there's a drought or if the logger is exposed at low tide, then Ruth and I will know that when it spits out the data, it will tell us whether or not the logger was out of water. And that just helps us with quality control. We make sure we're only recording stream temperatures, not air temperature. But if you have a challenging site where you don't want to get in the water again, um, and if you want to just be able to check the logger from the bank um, without stepping in the stream at all, there is the option to leave the Bluetooth always on. And that way you can communicate with the logger in the water. Um, but if you want to do anything besides Bluetooth off water detect, then please just um, let, let Ruth and I know ahead of time. So we'll know that um, we'll have to spend a little more time going over the data of that logger. And after you've done that, um, you can just check, make sure everything is looks how it's supposed to, and then click start at the top of the screen. Eventually something will happen. <laughs> and then click OK, and then you can exit the device or exit the app. So that's that's it. That's the programming piece. Um, so again, all of that information should also be transferred to the data sheet. Um, before you leave the field, um, there are two things you need to do on the data sheet. Um, the site sketch is it doesn't have to be you don't have to be an artist to do this. This is just a sketch um so that you can find the logger again i like to draw circles for culverts a direction of the stream for the direction of the flow um, the banks any landmarks anything that will help you relocate the logger when you go to visit the next week 
We'd also like you to take four, at least four pictures of the logger. Again, it's, this is because the most common cause of lost loggers is just poor documentation about where you put it. So take a logger in the stream next to a rock, then step back a little bit and get some landscape char characteristics that show the rock from a different perspective. Um, any Anything to help you relocate the logger and then email those pictures to Ruth and I and we'll match them up with the site. And that also helps us to make sure that it's, it's logging temperature from a good location in the stream as well. And there's a question that came in um, about whether the logger can be paired with multiple phones. Yes. Yep. Um, there's actually a setting, the, the default Hobo Mobile setting is for it to be able to access all phones. There's also a setting where you can lock it and have it only respond to your phone. But anybody should be able to go out and, and check your logger. So hopefully you'll be able to return to the site once per week. Um, this is just a really great supplement to the daytime smelt, smelt surveys. So some of you will be looking for smelt at tidal sites where smelt will not be laying eggs um, because the eggs would be killed by salt water. However, I have found smelt trapped downstream of culverts at low tide, so at some of those sites. So if you return to your site consistently, you're more likely to pick up that important information, both for DMR on smelt um, and for the water temperature for me. So it's it's a great opportunity to, to return to the stream and look for signs of smelt while you're downloading your data. Uh, you only have one data sheet that you will fill out for all of your remaining site visits throughout the season. This one is pretty straightforward. You just put your name, your site name, your logger serial number, and again, the logger coordinates. Um, so each time you return to the site, write down your date and time, um, check whether or not you've downloaded the data. Once you email the data, just make a note of it and put the date that you've emailed the data. Um, and if you can, measure the water depth um, and any additional notes or observations that are important. If you have to move the anchor because it's getting buried, um, or if you have any interesting observations of fish or wildlife in the field while you're there. And at the very end of the season, you can take a picture of this data sheet and, and email that to Ruth and me. All right, now we're going to go over downloading the data with the app. So first, if you have, uh, if you've selected the Bluetooth off water detect, which is my preference, um, you will need to take the logger out of the water in order to communicate with the phone. So you can just bring it to the bank or bring it somewhere dry or somewhere safe where you can connect with your phone. It has a pretty wide range. I think it's, it's at least 30 feet. So you don't need to be right next to it, but the logger and the anchor do need to be out of the water. Um, once your logger is actually in the anchor, you should not ever have to take the logger out of the anchor again. The Bluetooth goes right through the metal anchor. So find your device in range. If you can't find it, there, there are some troubleshooting tips in your protocol. Oh, and I... I wanted to show this too because if you once you start downloading data you might your app might open up to a different screen not this device's screen um, but that's that's okay it to switch from one screen to another you just have to tap these different icons at the bottom of the screen um, so tap devices when you're out there to download data and tap your logger when it shows up in the list Okay, once you're connected, um, just tap this readout button and a window should pop up and let you know that it's downloading the data. 
it generates a little graph and then there's another pop-up window that shows you it has been a success um, after the data has downloaded you should also see a little red circle next to this data files tab on the bottom of the screen so to view that and and at this point you can close the connection to your device you can put it back in this in the stream and you can go home and finish the rest of this later when you have a, a wi-fi connection um, so so that's it you can just return it to this to the screen and do the rest of this at home but when you're ready click on data files and there are a couple of different ways that you can email the data um, everything that you download will show up in a list the most recent download is always going to show up at the top and you can check the date and the time and make sure it matches with the date and time that you are out in the field um, so the first way to email this one by one is to tap the graph that you want to send it'll show there'll be a blown up image of the graph and then there will be this sharing icon at the top of the screen so you want to tap that arrow and then this might be a little different um, from an android and an iphone i have an iphone so this is what shows up but again in your protocols there's a step-by-step -step lined out um, for both of those devices we want you to share this as an excel file so that's the very top of the list tap that And once you tap the Excel file, then sh different sharing options should come up. Um, so I'm going to tap this mail icon and that will open my email and attach the spreadsheet to my email. And I'm just going to send this to myself so that I'm not spamming Ruth with a whole bunch of training, training emails, um, but you will, you will email this to Ruth as well. And if you want to write anything in the body of the email, any notes, any concerns that you have, then feel free to do that. And then, yeah, you can, interesting observations, anything. Um, you can also leave the body of the email blank. It's, it's up to you. And then when you're ready, click this blue arrow at the top of the screen and there will be no confirmation it will just send you back to this screen um, and then just select cancel it's going to feel like you're canceling out of the email but um, there's just no confirmation if you do it this way and then click done and you'll be sent back to the list the second way to do this is to tap select at the top of the page and if you use this you can send multiple files at once as well you can select as many files as you want um, if you you can also delete files this way um, once ruth gives you a confirmation that she's received your data um, then you can go ahead and delete the graph um, but we're going to do we're going to do a share for training purposes so when you select the circle that will just select the graph when you're ready to share hit share and the same the same window will come up we want to share as an excel file it'll show you the files that you're attaching to the email click this arrow at the top of the screen the same sharing options will come up and so again just enter the ruth's email my email and any notes and then click the arrow when you're done tap done again at the top of this screen and done at the top of the screen and that's it it's pretty simple once you've done it once or twice eventually after a qaqc process um, when ruth and i will look over the data then it will all end up on the EcoSheds viewer. So again, at the end of the smelt season, you'll be able to find your site, zoom in on it, um, and look at the temperature data of the stream. And so this, can, this site can stay up over multiple years. You'll be able to look at data from one year to the next, um, and we'll be able to start looking at trends. Um, some of this data will also 
enter will also be fed into a stream temperature model um, to help us understand or to help predict temperatures in streams where we don't have temperature loggers. And there's more information about all of this in your protocols. And so that's it. Um, if anyone has any questions or concerns or um, wants to talk about water temperature, I think we've got a good chunk of time left. So I'm going to stop my share. Feel free to just jump in with any questions. No, nope, they're pretty clear. Great. Great. Um, I'll be in touch. I think I've been in touch with a couple of you about um, scheduling site visits. I'll be in touch with the rest of you within the next week um, to figure out how to pass off all of this equipment um, and schedule from there. I think Miranda had asked a question about um, if we'll be giving all of the supplies for the um, for the anchors, or if um, if when you and I sort through them tomorrow, if if we'll be having um, kind of selecting for each site what to put in. So there are so we had more volunteers than metal anchors, which is awesome. So we we have a couple of there are a few sites. Um, where we will need to give volunteers, I think, PVC attached to bricks. Um, the majority of people will be getting multiple options so that you can decide um, which option to use once you're out there. Um, but there, yeah, there are a few sites that I'm familiar with, Ruth is, Ruth is familiar with, and that I think um, for those sites, we will probably give you a brick anchor ahead of time. And Kirsten, just to check, Brooke asked how, how many days worth of data the logger can store, and it's about two years, right? If you, if you set it to record every 30 minutes, it's five and a half years. It's oh, wow. these ones, yeah, these are an upgrade from our old ones. Um, yeah, the Bluetooth technology and their memory capacity is just, is huge. Um, however, if you did leave the Bluetooth always on, um, the battery would die in two and a half years. But with Bluetooth off water detect, it would last closer to those five and a half years. No worries at all if you miss a week. Nope. Um, the only concern, my, my big concern about um, anchors that are just placed on the bottom of a stream is that this is, this is a new experimental thing we're doing this year. So I um, having those frequent site checks, at least in the beginning, um, would be really great for those sites to make sure the anchor isn't getting moved around. Um, but you could put this out for the whole season um, and it will not fill up with data by the end of the by the end of May. Miranda, it looks like you have a question. I did. I have a couple, I think. I think Kirsten might have just answered the one I was thinking about though. Um, how long are these remaining out for? Is it all year or is it just for the smelt run? We've scheduled to have it out for the smelt run. I think if um, if you're interested in keeping it out longer at your site and gathering more data out there, um, I that seem I think that's totally an option, right? You don't need them yep. back. Yeah. Yep, definitely. Um, we just can't leave these ones in. They have to be out by November. We just can't leave them in over the winter time. Mm -hmm. Okay. That sounds good. Um, my other question was, darn, I think I'm already forgetting it. Okay, well, I knew my other, I had three questions, and I forget the second one, but the other one was I missed the smelt training that DM, D Danielle Frechette put on. I watched it last year, but do you know how I can get a hold of the be, recent recording or whatever? Yeah. They haven't sent out the recording yet. Um, okay, I was I sure if I missed that. That will be coming out soon. Um, so Daniel will be sending it out and then I'll also send out a link to it as well. Um, okay, that sounds good. Oh, I, okay, my other question. Um, do, are you guys like available to consult with if we're trying to choose what anchor style like 
you guys open the emails and stuff whenever we're trying to figure it out. Okay. Sounds yeah. Good. And, and I'm available to meet with you at the site too, if that would be helpful. Oh yeah. I think that might be okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and the, the metal anchors, um, were, it's a new method we're, we're piloting this year with citizen scientists. So thanks for giving us an opportunity to test it. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see how the, the bottom anchors work in those protected sites. I think we might have a couple, I think. Yeah, it'd be the Chops Creek site, um, Bethany, that I think you'll be doing might be a good one for, <laughs> for getting that set up. Um, and yeah, any other questions? Um, okay, well, great. Thank you all for joining tonight. I really appreciate that you took the time to join and, um, and I'll be in touch. And I think, I mean, the snow's almost gone. So we'll be ready to yeah. start the smoke monitoring within the next week or two. Um, Don't get ahead of yourself. Right. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's it's snowing here. <laughs> I guess that is uh, true. Yeah. You never know. March is March is a beast. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, I, I guess another thing to note, like um, I think Danielle had said smelt monitoring starts mid-March. Like don't don't monitor smelt if you have to walk across snow to get to your site. It's not worth it. Um, you probably won't see fish. So just, I think at, at all of our sites, we can wait until until the ice and snow is gone. Yep. Yep, and I just saw the question in the chat too. When are we ideally starting the monitoring? Um, I, For me, sure, right after you get the loggers, but it's also what works best for you, what works with Ruth. To, to meet you in the field um, and I, I can be available to to help out. Um, so I would say by the end of March is a good goal. Okay, well, awesome. I hope you all have a great night. Um, I'll, I'll send out, um, yeah, we'll be sending the protocols. Um, so we've got everything that was presented, well, not everything, but most of what was presented tonight is written out so that you don't need to memorize everything that was just shown. Um, and so you'll have references to look at. Um, and we'll have like a binder with the protocols for this and the protocols for the smelt monitoring, as well as the data sheets um, for all of you, along with the temperature kits. So that'll be, start. I'll be starting to pass those out next week. And I hope you all have a really lovely night. Yeah. Okay, take care. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.